Amen, amen. <clears throat> so here we've taken two weeks to talk about evangelism, right? To talk about how we are God's ambassadors, right? We went to 2 Corinthians 5, and 2 Corinthians 5 just it's such a great set of verses just to commission and recommission us when it says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, right? Second Corinthians 5. Then it goes on to say that he's given us a word of reconciliation in the next verse. So not only has he given us the ministry of going out into a world that is at odds with God and consisting of people walking in enmity with God because of the sin problem, but we we have the ministry of reconciliation by preaching the gospel we are preaching teaching how sinners can be reconciled with God how sinners and God can become friends because Amos 3 3 says can two even walk together unless they're in agreement we go out and share the good news of Jesus that he is the answer he is the bridge in between the chasm he is the Jacob's ladder and therefore by his death burial and resurrection and shed blood Blood, we can be washed clean and now be in right standing with God and walk in agreement with God. And I, when I just read Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? I just picture two people walking, holding hands. We have that message. And while the wages of sin is death, i.e. eternal separation from God, Knowing the terror of God, knowing the judgment of God, it says that we persuade men. Then 2 Corinthians 5 comes in and says that when we're sharing this message of reconciliation with this word of reconciliation, which is the gospel, that it's actually God begging through our voice. It says God is beseeching through our preaching. So week one, we just had a ball and really... Coming back to just understanding that we all have been given this commission, and when Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature, the great commission is not the great suggestion. It is a commission. It is a commandment. And the church has been walking for too long in the great omission, meaning that instead of doing it, you're just leaving it out. Um, every one of us has this ministry of reconciliation. We have the word of reconciliation. And when we're sharing that word, he's begging through us. So we really summarized week one in saying, hey, God's doing all the heavy lifting here. God is doing the heavy lifting. Should take a huge weight off of our shoulders but we still want to feel the burden for souls, yes? I mean, picture what Paul said in Romans 9. He said, I want to see my kinsmen. He says, I go and preach to Gentiles all over the world, but I still want to see my own kinsmen, my Israelite, my Jewish people saved. I want to see them saved so bad. I would be willing to go to hell just that they could go to heaven. So while God is doing the heavy lifting and while only the Holy Spirit can convert a soul, right? We still want, yes, to rest in him doing the heavy lifting, but we, him doing the heavy lifting does not mean that we're to be burden free. We want that burden. How badly, how much do you ache? How much do we ache to see those around us saved? Paul wanted to see them saved so much because see, Paul really believed the judgment day was coming. Maybe you get some believers that really don't believe that there's a place called hell and really don't believe that Hebrews 9, 27, once you die, there is a judgment. Uh, so therefore, they don't feel moved to be in the place of worrying for friends and loved ones. There is a hell. There is a judgment. There is eternal separation from God. Gehenna. And knowing that, Paul said he would be willing to go there just so his kinsmen could go to heaven. Now, obviously, that's not how a person gets saved. You don't trade out your salvation. But we want to walk in the balance of God's doing that, all the heavy lifting. We just make ourselves available. We, make, we accept the fact that we have a ministry. We share the words of the gospel. And we let God do the begging through us and take rest that it's him doing it. But we also want to walk in the burden of so much so wanting people to get saved, that we're willing to fast, that we're willing to stay up all night on our knees. Would we come back to asking God to give us that kind of burden? Because think of how many people we say, I love you to. I love you. I love you. I love you. 
Yeah, right? You're my this, you're my that, you're my BFF, you're my all these things. But if they don't know the Lord, how much are we really, how much are we really loving them? So that was week one and then went into week two. And it's like, okay, we get it now. We get it and praise God. The word is so clear. The Holy Spirit coming behind his word. After two weeks of talking about evangelism, you know, we get it. It's time to get back on the great commission and stop and repent of regarding it as a great suggestion and leaving it out as a great omission. We have the good news that a lost and dying world desires. People are choking on the stagnant waters of Babylon, Jeremiah 2, and we have that living water. We have what if people drink, they will never thirst again. People are looking for love in all the wrong places. We have the message of the one who is the true lover of their souls. So yes, we need to get back to this. But when it comes to evangelism and sharing the gospel, I think we fall in this trap of making it such an intellectual thing, right? So now it's like, okay, I get it. And we do. We've been given, you know, the mind so that we can process, right? Uh, the mind, right, makes a convert of the emotion. The emotion makes a convert of the will. So it does begin in the mind, right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, in light of God's mercies, as spelled out in Romans 1 through 11. That's speaking to the mind. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice. He, I, I beseech you by the mercies of God. The information written out of all of God's mercy to the mind, now his, it's all about his mercy that melts the heart and then that converts the will. Now, in light of that, it, I am moved to present my body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. So yes, it does begin in the mind. The mind makes a convert of the emotion and the heart. The heart makes a convert of the will. But let me just share, let me unpack more where I'm going with this. We get stuck at the mind. We get stuck at the mind, okay? Um, that actually is a lot of the leaven of French philosophers that have not only permeated much of Western civilization and how we think, but even how much the church thinks. When you think of the philosopher Descartes, you know, I think, therefore I am. We are walking in a lot of that leaven because as you study the scriptures, it, it does not stop at the mind. We having a lot of the leaven and influence of secular philosophy, try to think through so much that now when I get a message like this, it's like, okay, I've got to think evangelism. I've got to think Jesus is awesome. I've got to think, you know, uh, th th something great to share. I've got to think that I make sure not to forget to share. And what are we doing? Thinking, thinking, thinking. For you know it, you, one, you're, now you're trying to do it in your own strength. And then you end up saying, you know, just like Paul in Romans 7, 14, what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate doing, I keep doing. Where am I going with this? There's a solution. There is a solution. We need to stop at the mind. Stop stopping at the mind, rather. And we need to let the mind now make a convert of the heart, which will make a convert of the will. What I'm saying is, the more the gospel means to you individually, the easier, the more of a delight, the more natural, and the more regularly will you find yourself evangelizing. Matter of fact, you sharing the gospel is a function of how much you love the gospel. The more you love the gospel, the more you will share the gospel. How do we love the gospel more? We love the gospel more by growing deeper in all of what it means and all of who Jesus is. Do you follow that? What I need to share at this point, and, and this is, we've got to really, you know, as being a, a thinking people, we have to really unpack this right. Are y'all are following with me so far? Okay. What we have to do at this point is, we have to say, okay, here is the gospel that has saved my soul. Here is all of what the scripture says about the gospel. Am I continuing to let this gospel be this thing that personally means more to me than anything else? 
You see Paul talk about sharing the gospel, but then you see Paul also writing and saying, my gospel. I think a lot of believers, we're still, we know that we're saved, but we're stuck at the gospel. And we've not yet gotten to the point by falling deeper and deeper in love with it to where it's my gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please write this down. Yes, we need to talk more about Christians serving. Yes, we need to talk more about Christians uh, just resisting the lukewarmness of our day and getting skin in the game, right? But we also need to be careful of this. Christianity is not defined by what we do and don't do. Christianity is defined by who we are. It's not defined by what we do and don't do. It's defined by who we are. So what we'll say to motivate someone to serve more is, hey, make sure that you're not calling on Jesus just to stay out of hell. Don't let him just be fire insurance, right? Dot, dot, dot. Therefore, serve. Therefore, do the Christian thing. But we could actually apply it in this way too. Don't just let Jesus be your fire insurance. Don't just let him be the reason you're not going to hell. Love him. Celebrate who he is for you daily in every way. Call him as your first love. Lean upon him as your first love. And let the gospel continue to be the gift that keeps giving. Then you will find that evangelism will not be a duty. It will be a delight. Psalm 66, verse 16, it says, Draw near unto me, and I will declare what he's done for my soul. I think it's interesting that it doesn't say, I'll declare what he's done for me intellectually. It says what he's done for my soul, what he's done for the seat of my affections, the seat of my emotions. Draw near, and I will share what he has done for my soul. So I would like to give you three points. Three points. One, eternal life is not just a length of time. Eternal life is not just a length of time. It's a quality of life. Eternal life is not just a length of time. It is a quality of life. When we say we're going to live forever, that's a fact. When it says that those that call upon the name of the Lord and put their faith in the gospel will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That is also speaking of a length of time, but we could fall into the trap of just saying, okay, my sin issue is settled. I'm going to heaven and I'm going to live in heaven forever. And therefore eternal life is just a length of time. It is a length of time, but along with being a length of time, it is also a quality of life. That should get us stirred into really asking ourselves, one, is the gospel meaning all that it can mean to me, right? And two, am I really cashing in on everything the gospel has done for me? Am I really allowing the gospel to go to my every fear, allowing the gospel to go to my wounds, to my lonelinesses, to my worries, to my temptations, to my easily besetting sins, to all of these things? Am I allowing the gospel to saturate every issue, problem, dilemma in my life with expectation that it will continue to show off the glory of God? Eternal life is not just a length of time, it's a quality of life. And even Jesus said that in John chapter 10, verse 10. The devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. I've come to give life and to give life more abundantly. He comes in and qualifies eternal life as an abundance of life, a life of abundance here now in the land of the living, not just in heaven. So point one, eternal life is not just a length of time, it is a quality of life. Point two, you can have eternal life. You can have eternal life and fall short of experiencing the blessings of it. You can have eternal life and fall short of experiencing the blessings of it. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. 
You look at the Israelites who crossed the Red Sea, a type of salvation, but all their experience in the book of Numbers was losing every battle, running with their tail between their legs, walking in fear, compromise, and being owned by their own flesh and their own murmuring spirit, right? You can have eternal life and fall short of the blessings of it. And point three, when we allow eternal life to be all of what it is meant to be in our lives, evangelism goes from being a duty to a delight. When we allow eternal life to be all of what it is, evangelism goes from being a duty, a duty to a delight. It's really about falling in love with Jesus. It's really about examining what we really believe. It's really about looking at our actions. And it's really about looking at the places where we've just so easily settled with just our sin debt being paid uh, as though God did not promise a different type of life for us now. Are we getting that? So picture your fears, your issues, your lonelinesses, you know, it says in the scriptures, the heart knows its own issues. You know what you're going through now. What areas of your life have you just been leaving um, apart from allowing gospel saturation to come in and bring abundant life? What parts of your heart, what parts have you allowed? You know you're saved. You know all the theology. Matter of fact, let me break it down with an analogy. This morning, I had just a great treat. My son and daughter, my oldest son and daughter drove in with me. I think it's probably the first time in years where they actually came in with me because usually I'm staying after church serving so long. I'm going home once the sun is down. So we actually drove in together today. It was awesome. So, of course, they said, well, we'll come. But, you know, can we call in an order at Starbucks along the way? I said, OK, yeah, you can call in an order at Starbucks along the way. So we pull up at the Starbucks. They've done the mobile order thing and all of that. Josiah hops out the car, goes inside, comes out empty handed, empty handed. And he says, well, I got some news for you all. Um, he says, I did type in what everyone wanted. I typed in all the details. I just forgot to hit order at the end. So there's nothing waiting there. Well, Annie, you know, gave grace. I didn't get anything. So I was cool either way. I, just, I was just ready to get to church. So we're cruising now. But I was like, what an analogy. Look at us, how we know all the right theology. We have all the right verses on fear, all the right verses on what the gospel means for your loneliness, all the right verses for what the gospel means for your depression, all the right verses for what the gospel means for just shame, all the right verses for what the gospel means for self-condemnation, all the verses for what the gospel means for lust and easily besetting sins, and we can write them all down, we can quote them, have our favorites, just like he put in his order, he put in this and that and a little of this and a little of that, we can have all of that and just not hit the order button and actually applying it. So there is a solution here. There is a solution. And I would like to go to Ephesians. And then I would like, matter of fact, let's go to Song of Solomon first. Let's go to Song of Solomon first. God's desire is that we would be so rocked by the gospel, that we would be so rocked by him as the one who says, call upon me and I will deliver you. As the one who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. As the one who says, by my stripes, you are healed. By the one who even says, you have not because you ask not. The Lord so is looking to rock his people that I know the Lord marvels as he just sees his people writing everything down as those who are going to hit the send button taking lists, appropriating scripture, rightly dividing as those who are going to hit the send button and the order button and not ordering, hey, I'll take one order of the gospel at the end, the order button. Now, here it is. I will look for what the gospel means for this part of my life and I will claim it as mine. Look at Song of Solomon 5. I think this is a great display of natural evangelism as a delight because the person truly, truly has tasted and is tasting the goodness of God. Let's look at this. It says in 
Let's just start at Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. It says, I sleep, but my heart wakes. It's the voice of my beloved that knocks and says, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. This is a type of Christ coming and knocking for, on the heart of the individual believer to spend time together, right? Well, look at this. Look at this is us now, verse 3, the excuse making. And really, you could just write in your notes, failure. I have put off my coat already. How shall I put it back on? I've already washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Lord, you know, uh, I've, I already sat down and my Bible's over there. You know, Lord, I mean, I, I just put this on TV program and now your Holy Spirit's drawing me. Oh, Lord, oh, fasting, but Lord, I just went grocery shopping. I mean, that's us right here, right? Verse four, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. This is just the faithfulness of God even when we're not faithful in responding to his love. Let's keep reading. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handle of the lock. This is a type of, I can, the, the, the aroma of the Holy Spirit. Clearly the person is saying that the Holy Spirit is doing this here, right? Verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but look at this, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and he was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought for him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. And the keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. What a picture of God being the faithful shepherd that he is, his mercies new every morning, daily drawing us to spend time with him, daily beseeching us and wooing us to come into his presence. And what a picture of us doing, making excuses, coming to him on our own terms, when our own time, our hearts moved, you know, when we're ready for our heart to be moved, and then suddenly, you know, we have left our first love and that sense of his presence is not there. This is what I think is beautiful. Verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me, they smote me. And then look at all the warfare, the unnecessary warfare we go through, the unnecessary beatings we take from the world, all because we don't spend that time with them. Are you follow all this? Okay, but here's the thing. This person, nonetheless, a type of the believer, still knows their identity. Now let's watch. And this is what happens when you truly know who you are in the gospel. Let's look at this. Verse 8, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick of love. Tell him I'm lovesick. Just I'll do anything to get back into his presence. Then look at this. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus charge us? So what's the big deal with your Lord? That's what they're saying. What's the big deal with your Jesus? What's the big deal with going to church? What's the big deal with you? You're, what, you're so passionate about it. You know, now you're saying you're even lovesick. What's the big deal with, with it all? If you want to write in your notes, this is an evangelism moment. But I want you to look at this and I want you to see, is it reading like a duty or is it reading like a delight? I think you already know the answer. Then we're going to talk about how do we get there? Do you follow where we're at now? All right. It says, My beloved is radiant and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. That's where we get in so many songs, he's the fairest among 10,000. His head is as most fine gold. His locks are bushy, as black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings, set with the beryl. His belly as the bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, as excellent as the cedar forest. I mean, even by the description, you could just see that it is even beyond just the description of a human, right? And then it says this, his mouth is most sweet, 
Yea, he is altogether lovely. Again, the song we sing, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you are God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy. That's again, comes from this right here. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. That's delight. This reads like someone who does not have to consult the apologetics manual really quickly. This reads like someone that does not have to take five minutes and listen to a worship song and get in the mood before giving the answer, yes? This is not read, read like someone that needs uh, two other people with them, you know, to be able to share. This is not read like someone that's just doing a duty just so they can have a checklist. This doesn't read like someone that just wants to show their theological strength and how much they know so the person could say, oh my gosh, you're so deep. This reads like someone that as a natural, as a, any reflex, is in love and is delighted to share who the lover of their soul is. But this takes faith, this takes time, this takes intention, this takes desire, and this takes allowing the gospel to saturate all of who you are. Now look at verse 6. After sharing that kind of evangelism, look at the response of them. Whether, Song of Solomon 6, verse 1, whether is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women, where is thy beloved turned aside, that what? That we may seek him with you. You see, what the world needs is not just to hear the gospel message as we talk about the love of God. The world needs to hear the gospel message from people who are so in love with God because they really get how much God is in love with them. 1 John 4, 19. Do you follow that? But again, it's not a matter of, oh, well, I get it now because we don't want to get, we always overthink things and let's just make sure we keep it all Bible. We don't want to fall in the trap of, okay, I get it. I want to share evangelism like that. So I'm going to go deeper in the heart of the Lord so that I can share that way. No, that's not, that's not what you do. No, I'm going to go deeper into the heart of my Lord. And oh, by the way, I will end up delightfully sharing this way. Let's go to Ephesians and let's look at two prayers Paul prayed for the saints and see that this is actually how we do it. Because now the thing is, okay, how do we do it? Before we even do that, I actually took some notes and I want to bring them up because if you look at the life of Paul, interestingly, Paul says in Romans chapter one, I'm ready to preach the gospel. But you also see three instances in his epistles when he calls it my gospel. Why? Because Paul did not just let it be the means of him being justified before God. Paul did not just let it be the information that the world needs. Paul let it be all of what it's supposed to be. Everlasting life, which is a quality of life, which means anything that stands in the face of that, he is bringing the bulldozer of gospel love. Well, let's look at it. As you study Paul's life, so interestingly, you see fear. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. He said, there were fightings outside, there were fears inside of me. We see Paul wrestling with self-condemnation in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this woeful, condemned place, right? We see Paul wrestling with loneliness and isolation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, he says, at my first trial that I went to, no believers, after I've served so much of the then known world, when I went to my first trial, no believers showed up that when I looked over my shoulder, could just see one person doing this. We see Paul wrestling with evil. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, I know my God will deliver me from every evil work. We see him wrestling with weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. When I am weak, he is strong. We see Paul dealing with doubt. When we believe not, he still is faithful. Worry. Philippians chapter 4. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. And the peace of God will stand guard over your heart. We see him ministering about a shameful past. Paul says, this is what I do. I forget what is behind me. I leave my shameful past in the past and I look to ahead. Now, again, how many of you can write 
your own verses to all of these issues that Paul wrestled with. But just like the analogy with Starbucks, are you forgetting to hit the send button? And when we're forgetting to hit the order button, you've written out all of the verses. You've written out all of the verses that minister to your life, to your needs, to your situation. But you're doing everything but standing on them. You're doing everything but expecting God via the gospel, via the finished work of Christ, via and being the fact that you're not a child of God. And he says, call me daddy, call unto me, and I'll show you great and mighty things. I'm able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. And meanwhile, what do we do? We just write out the verse verses and we don't hit order. And you can tell by how much is in our lives that we're just allowing to stay as though there is no gospel solution. How much fear do we allow to stay as though there's no gospel solution? How much depression do we allow to stay as though there's no gospel solution? How much worry do we allow to stay as if there's no gospel solution? How much loneliness is there as though there's no gospel solution? So, We want to make sure and make a new day today where we're not just writing out verses anymore. That we're not just going, you know, to what the good book says about our problem and then celebrating the sufficiency of Scripture. We want to make sure that we're hitting the order button afterwards. And notice that when you hit the order button at Starbucks, it means that you you don't go in there wondering if they're going to have your order. You go in there to get your order. We don't just want to hit the order button, but we want to hit the order button in a way where you know the Lord is going to move in those ways. Because it says in the scriptures that when we pray according to his will, he hears us, right? And believe me, this is ministering to me in a whole new way of like, wow, how much time am I spending on my knees daily? taking everything to God and hitting an order button and knowing that gospel abundant life is on the way to anything that besets me or befalls me. To really get this is to really say, how can I ever be too busy for this? And to make time for this is to get so rocked by it that now you begin to share the Lord as a delight. Matter of fact, you'll feel like you can't even shut up if someone gets you talking. It's no longer this intellectual duty of sharing the gospel. It is the chief delight for you to share how good he is to you for every testimony you have from every test and, you know, every, you know, praise you report you have from every problem. Paul talked about needs. He who's not, he who didn't spare his only begotten son, how shall he not freely give us all things? The gospel, you write this in your notes, please. The gospel means a position. The gospel means a standing. The gospel means you're a new creation. We just stand on, oh, a new creation means I'm no longer my old man condemned to a sinner's hell. Yes, that's true. But as a new creation, it means we're a new phenomenon. That's what it really means. When 1 Peter 2.9 comes in and says, you're a peculiar people, it means that you, above all the people of the earth, can actually go to God and bring all of what your needs are as a child goes to their daddy, and you can watch the gospel glory enter into that situation and bring resurrection change and glory. And for the things that he doesn't change, he'll change you. So it's always win-win. Christianity is more than what you do or don't do. It's who you are. The gospel and a new creation and a peculiar people is our identity. And it's interesting, right? You look at how many movies... You know, Hollywood likes to do this. Hollywood, you know, obviously the world uh, even has this, this pining after a reality that identity means everything. If you saw the movie The Matrix, right? Remember that he's this computer hacker named Mr. Anderson, right? And then Lawrence Fishburne comes and finds him and says, no, you are really this person of untapped potential whose name is Neo, and you're going to bring change, and you're going to bring a a whole salvation to a people, right? Uh, But when the enemies come after this guy and these agents are pursuing him, what do they call him throughout the movie? Are they calling him Neo? 
No, they keep referring to him as his old name, Mr. Anderson. Then you remember the train scene when the agent is holding him and like, oh, here comes the train. The train's going to hear you, you know, and he says, Mr. Anderson. And then finally he says, my name is Neo. And in standing on his identity, he begins to just operate differently. See the same thing in the movie, The Black Panther. When he's standing at the waterfalls and anyone can come and challenge the Black Panther to become the king and it seems like there's no one that wants to come and challenge and then those from like the gorilla clan come through the cave looking thorough as ever, you know, he starts fighting the Black Panther and what's he do? He's got him just like he's in a back-breaking move, you know, and then his sister yells from the edge, you know, you know, who you are, stand on who you are and what does he do? He yells out his name, his identity and that causes him to no longer accept the identity of just laying and just waiting for his back to get broke now if Hollywood movies if Hollywood movies are in love with this concept of how identity and knowing who you are changes a whole movie and a whole whatever the scenario is in that movie how much more so us who really are that peculiar people who really do have a duality of the flesh and the spirit, the old man and the new man, how much so us when we really stand on who we are in the gospel, in our identity. That's why I say Christianity is not defined by what you do or don't do. It's who you are. And who you are brings privilege. Who you are brings power. Eternal life is not a length of time only. It is actually a quality of life. So what do we do with all this? This is what we do. Let's look at two prayers that Paul prayed. Because when we see a man like Paul, who obviously dealt with worry, loneliness, right? Fear, um, you know, self-condemnation, and all of these things. And we see him walk victoriously. Two things. One, we want to know what's his secret, right? Two, I'd want to know what his prayer is and his desire is for the people he disciples, right? If you want to find out what's dear to someone, all you got to do is listen to what they teach. We have it in the form of two prayers, and this is where we're going to wrap this up. We have it in the form of two prayers, and I think the first thing we're going to realize when we look at these prayers is how little we regard them, but how much there is in them. Let's look. And in light of everything we've shared up to this point, now it should click, right? We've said, you know, the gospel is a quality of life as well as a length of time. Christianity is not defined by what you do or don't do as much as it's defined by who you are and identity, right? Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's start at verse 16. Paul has led these believers to Christ. He is now writing a letter back to young believers and he's going to let them know. The mentor is letting the mentees know what his desire is for them. But in this, he's actually sharing his secret for success. He's sharing his secret of gospel satisfaction. He's sharing his secret for gospel wholeness. He's sharing his secret for really walking in all of what eternal life is. You ready? Okay, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Really, verse 15. Wherefore, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Okay, so if you really want to know what a person desires for someone more than anything else, listen to what they pray for that person. Here it is. He says, my prayer is this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The first thing he says is, for you to go deeper in getting all of this, it is going to have to be Holy Spirit downloaded. And you will have to look and honor and cry out for the Holy Spirit to reveal this to you. This is not a matter of, oh man, convicting message today. What do I read now? This message should not lead you to scratch the head. Scratching the head is, 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 a, is a symbol of I'm thinking this out and I'm planning it out. What it really should lead you to do is crying out for the Holy Spirit to do the work. Look at what he says. My first prayer is that 
the Father of glory would give you by the Holy Spirit wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The first thing he prays for people who are already saved, but he wants them to go deeper in what? Abundant life. As a quality of life, the first thing he prays for them is that they would really receive revelation in who the Father is. So it begins with this. How much are you going deeper in understanding your Father? And when the Holy Spirit comes to knock, if you will, as we read in Song of Solomon 5, how much excuse making are you making, excuse making are you making, with the reasons why you don't have time to respond? I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Look at this, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Interesting, it says here, the eyes of your understanding. You notice it doesn't say the eyes of your intellect. Again, we fall in that Descartian trap of I think, therefore I am. Everything is intellectual. Everything is intellectual. Then we even give ourselves intellectual lectures. You need to love God more. You need to do this more. You need to evangelize more. And it's all in the head and all in the head. No wonder we end up with a migraine. But notice this. One, he says, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit gives you supernatural revelation. No matter what you've been through, no matter what daddy issues you got, no matter what it is, or just God being the invisible God, that the Holy Spirit would give you mind blowing revelation in who your daddy is. One. Two, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know the Greek word for understanding there is actually cardio? The way we behave, you'd think it was the eyes of your intellect. He's not talking to the intellect here. He's talking about the heart. He's saying, I pray that your heart would get a pair of eyes. That's what he's basically saying. I pray that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your cardio, I'm praying your heart, not just your mind getting eyes of, wow, that's a great truth. Wow, that's a great remedy. You know, no, that your heart would get eyes, that your heart would get eyes. And once your heart gets eyes, that you may know the hope of his calling, that you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. What power is it? It's the same resurrection power, verse 20, that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And look at this, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. What the NIV Bible says for that verse 20, is that he is the fullness that fills everything. Now bring back again our issues, the fears, the worries, the lonelinesses. All of those things, the word just says here that he's praying that the eyes of our heart, that our heart would get eyes to seeing him as the fullness of him that fills all in all, that he is the one who fills all things. When the Lord redeemed us, he redeemed every part of us. So why do we keep so many parts of our life where we don't hit the order button and allow him to be the fullness that fills all things? Do you see that? So it's really, really, you know, we're so good at putting the ball in God's court. Well, I'm so fearful because God hasn't moved yet. I'm in this lonely place because God hasn't moved yet. I'm in this depressed place because God hasn't moved yet. And we're putting so much the ball in his court, but very much like Isaiah 58, when they were fasting and fasting and fasting and saying, God, why aren't you answering? He was saying, you're fasting, but you're fasting the wrong way. Let me show you the right way. Because when you do it the right way, I will answer as soon as you call. Your health will spring forth and you will walk in this abundant life and your mind will be blown. What he's saying here is, I am the fullness that fills everything. So if there is a place where we're not experiencing eternal life, abundant life, fullness in any part of our life, it's because the eyes of our heart are not seeing it and we're not seeing him as the one who fills everything. Does that make sense? Let's go to Ephesians 3, and we'll look at this second prayer. And the design of this today is that you now would continue on your own journey of going deeper and falling in love with Jesus. 
So if you're kind of expecting this to be this message where it's like, oh my gosh, by the time the message was over, I just wanted to do 20 backflips and I get it now and I don't got to read. I'm so happy. I don't run out the church without my Bible and oh my, and well, that might happen. But no, the design of this message is that you would actually get in your Bible, that you really would go back to these prayers. Why did God memorialize these prayers? It is a man who found victory, who found abundant life, and he is telling his mentees, I'm praying and instructing you on how you can get it. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Two prayers in one epistle. In Ephesians 3, he says this, and let's look at verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. By the way, that is a verse that proves that when a person passes away, they immediately go to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Some try to teach a soul sleep. That because the rapture verses of 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about the dead in Christ will rise when the trumpet blows, that that somehow means that they're in a soul sleep until the trumpet. No, Paul is saying, as I'm writing this, there is family in heaven. Do you see what he just said? That means that there are obviously those that were absent from the body and went right to the Lord. He didn't say, look, I write this of whom the whole family on earth and in soul sleep are named. I write this of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth are named. Just an interesting thing to have. But let's get back to business. Verse 16, here's my prayer, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened by his might, by his spirit in the inner man. Now, because we're so caught up in thinking that Christianity is chiefly what we do, we'll look at a verse like that and say, oh yeah, good prayer, Paul. I need that Holy Spirit because there's a lot of work to do. Yes, it's true, but this context is not for that. He's actually noticed that in the first prayer, he was praying that the Holy Spirit would unravel and unlock and reveal mind-blowing stuff. He puts the burden on God's spirit. God wants to do the heavy lifting. He does the same thing here, that you would be strengthened by his spirit. Strengthened for what? Strengthened strengthen what? What, the mission trip that's coming up? The work to be done? Uh, the duty of sharing the gospel? No, strengthened for this. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you be rooted and grounded in love. Would you underline rooted and grounded? Does the church talk about Jesus today as mere theologians? Or does the church of today talk about Jesus as those who are rooted and grounded in his love? that they have roots that have grown into the Lord. They are rooted in it and they are grounded in what? Not in his, not in gnosis, not in just knowledge, in his love. Let's keep reading. Verse 18, and that by doing this, by being rooted and grounded in his love, that you may comprehend with all saints, look at this, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge. So you might be filled with the fullness of God. He basically says in the first prayer that Jesus is the fullness who desires to fill everything, right? Now he's saying that his desire is that you would actually be filled with the fullness of God. So we have to ask ourselves, are we crossing over? Here's the reality. Jesus Christ, whether we take him at his goodness or not, is the fullness who fills everything. But are we crossing over from chapter one to chapter three and actually seeking to be filled with the fullness of God? And how are you filled with the fullness of God? By being rooted and grounded in his love. Well, let's keep going. Look at this again. He says this again, that Christ may dwell, Ephesians 3, 17, in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, the multidimensional love of the Lord. And look at this, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So wait a minute, to know something that passes knowledge? He's saying that you would experientially know this love that passes mere intellectual knowledge of his love. He's saying, my prayer is that you would be experientially rocked by his love, which is more than just having books and underlines in the book about his love and knowing it and knowing how to reference it. 
Are we in that place? Are we seeking to be in that place? Or in the reality, are we cultivating our love elsewhere, giving our energies elsewhere, and we're madly in love with everything else but the Lord? He says, this is the key to being filled with the fullness of God. So when I list my issues, whatever they are, we just went through Paul and to follow his life is to see all the issues of the human experience. Am I standing and taking them under the banner of God's love, knowing that I will be filled with all the fullness I need in all of those capacities? If I'm not doing that, I am not allowing the gospel to saturate every part of my life. You can be heaven bound and not be allowing the gospel to saturate every part of your life here. You're heaven bound because you've allowed it to answer the biggest question, which is the sin debt. But now in your sanctification, you are heaven bound. But your earthly journey looks like one who is not allowing the gospel to saturate every part of their life, which you could take back to not being rooted and grounded in his love, in not allowing that Holy Spirit to direct you. The Holy Spirit's desire is to strengthen. He's saying the Holy Spirit is giving your inner man the strength for the journey to go deeper into the heart of, of, of Jesus. But are you riding that train in? Or do you have other trains to catch, other places to be, other places to go? Now unto him, now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. We love that verse, but don't we love it even more in its context? Wow. Because it means, it's almost as though the writer is anticipating that the minute it's talking about being filled with God, rocked by God, saturated in his love, that immediately all the Goliaths inside of us raise their ugly head. Depression says, well, what about me? I don't know about that. Fear says, well, what about me? I've been here a long time. All types of issues, loneliness is different. I've been here a long time. There's what statistics say about me, though. And it's as though the writer now needs to come in because, see, when we hear good news, the first thing that doubt does is looks for reasons why the good news won't apply. It's something that's what makes us sinners. We don't even want it to happen. It just happens. You hear that the, this is so all encompassing that what does the wicked flesh do and a doubting heart do? It's like, but I don't know about this one, but I don't know about that one. And it's kind of like, no, duh, because all of heaven would see that you don't even pray about those things. So you, you, it's clear by your lack of prayer about it. It's clear by your not hitting the order button on it that you don't believe that he really wants to give you that fullness. Then verse 20 comes in and says, in light of all those Goliaths that say, I'm not going nowhere. All those Goliaths that say, come on, you've been saved for years. You really think this is going to change now? You think one message can do it? Here's verse 20. It's not about just, quote, the message. It's the promise of God. It's the faithfulness of God. Do you get it? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. The gospel is the gift that keeps giving. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So my brothers and sisters, that's the message today. And it really does come down to, is what I stand on the gospel or is it my gospel? Just as when you saw Jacob make the transition from referring to Yahweh as the God of my fathers to the point where he said, my God. Is the gospel so dear to you that like Paul, you have to call it my gospel? Or is it just this intellectual, you know, exchange of work to do and souls to get saved? And it's just the gospel, you know, the gospel is the gospel. And it is the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel. It's even called in Revelation. But is it so dear to you? Because it continues to blow you away with all of what the love of Christ means and all of what the fullness of God means as God really saturates every place, goes into the ugliest parts of your life, the nastiest parts, the parts no one know about, the parts you couldn't even describe to someone if you wanted to describe, and goes in there. And what does he bring? His love and the fullness of him that fills all things. Are we allowing that to happen? Unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. So now it comes down to a faith thing. Now it comes down to a faith thing. Are we now going to start hitting the order button on some stuff? 
looking where we, we've had the verses for years. You've gone to conferences on some of them struggles. You, you, you have books on them. We, the issues, you have it. It's there. And hey, it's one thing to have it. But are you hitting that gospel order button? And hitting that gospel order button as one who in Ephesians 1 has, understands the hope of his calling. See what he said? Go back to Ephesians 1 more, one more time. It's interesting that the first thing he said, I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you wisdom and revelation in who your daddy is so you would know. And in the three things listed, the first thing he lists is the hope of his calling. You see, the key, what the gospel gives us is hope. That when we come to him with our needs as his kids, that his love that we should be rooted and grounded in comes and fills all things and brings gospel revelation gospel glory, gospel goodness, where there's only darkness, despair, and fallenness before. Are we getting this? I pray, oh, oh there's, one, you go, there's one of them you want to get. There's one of them you want to get, you want to get, and this is the journey that we need to be on. There are believers that maybe today realize, yeah, you've been studying the Bible a long time. Yeah, every Sunday, you know what to do. You got your Bible open and all of this, and this is really coming down to how much are you really keeping the main thing, the main thing? How much are you truly loving the Lord and how much are you truly going deeper in the unspeakable gift of the gospel? Paul called it an unspeakable gift. Paul is, his, he shines as this man that he allowed the gospel into every facet, every challenge and every part of his life and he was so rocked that he was, he was left speechless when trying to describe it. He called it an unspeakable gift. So, I pray that these two prayers become prayers that you go deeper in and deeper in and that you now begin to re-examine how you've really been walking this out and how much perhaps you've even just been letting Jesus be your fire insurance and not your hero for every area where you need him. Just the one who's going to keep you out of hell and keep the devil from taking your head off and then take you to heaven. Oh, he's so much more than that, though. He is a gospel hero for every situation in our life. And it's time that we begin looking at him again in that way. And as he shows up and shows off in all of these areas of your life, you will find that your evangelism is no longer a duty, no longer a, oh, didn't get to share that, hung up already. It will be a delight. It will be as simple as just a knee being hit, you know, with the reflex hammer. So I'm going to pray now, and as I do, and let's have the worship team come up, that you would re-examine struggles, that you would re-examine ways of thinking, that you would re-examine fears, that you would re-examine how you process worry, that you would re-examine loneliness, that you would re-examine whatever needs that need to be addressed and that you would begin to look at them in a gospel context with Christ's love in a whole new way. And my brothers and sisters, that's how you fall more in love with Jesus. That's how people who have just accepted the fact that they don't enjoy reading the Bible, this is how people start reading and loving the Bible. People that don't like praying, this is how people start loving to pray. People that have just accepted, there are too many believers that secretly they have accepted, accepted, accepted a substandard, substandard dose of abundant qualitative supernatural living. Not because God's holding back, but because they are not allowing their minds to get firmly rooted and grounded in the length, depth, width, and all of the knowledge of Jesus that passes intellectual knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. So the question is just this now. Who wants to get rocked by his love in a whole new way? Rocked by his power in a whole new way? Who's tired of this Descartian way of doing Christianity where you just, it's, you've made it into a thinking man's game? It's not a thinking man's game. It's a game of the heart. That's why he said, I pray that your heart gets eyes, not your mind. It's time for our heart to get eyes for these things. And no longer just our mind being fixed on this while it's fixed on a million other things and a million other social media apps. Oh, the, a lot, there's a lot competing for the mind. But in the midst of all of that, our heart can grow eyes 
He said that. The eyes of your understanding, the Greek word, your heart. Our heart can get eyes to see, to see and to experience the love of Jesus in a whole new way. So struggles, yeah, they don't have the final say. Porn, it doesn't have the final say. Depression, doesn't have the final say. Addiction, it doesn't have the final say. Not, for the, not, if you're, not if you're a peculiar people, not if you're a first Peter 2, 9 peculiar people. Not if you're a child and that's your daddy. So it's time for us to really, really examine, okay, is this gospel that I stand on something I love so much that I call it my gospel? You know, it's my gospel, man. Let me tell you about my gospel. Oh, problem arise? Oh, let me tell you about my gospel. Things that go bump in the night? Oh, let me tell you about my gospel. Struggle? Oh, let me tell you about my gospel. Oops, time for my gospel. Just like someone says, oh, my show's on. I got to go. My show's on, right? You, the, the person loves the show so much, it's my show. They didn't say the show's on, my show's on. That you, you clearly see that not only are they going to watch them, they, they feel such a way about it that it, they're, they're, they're taking it as, like it's theirs. We've got to get to that place with the gospel. But that happens as you begin to let the fullness of him who filleth all in all really into those areas and, don't, and stop just writing out the verses that apply and not hitting the order button. Some order buttons got to get hit today. A lot of order buttons. And what does it say? That you would know the hope of his calling. You hit that button in hope. Hope that never disappoints. Call it the hope button now. The hope button. So again... And I better stop because I'll keep going. In the church, you're not going to see people that are lacking Bible verses that apply to their struggles. But because we're really not letting the gospel be all of what the wonderful gospel is, well, you do see a lot of verses and no one is hitting the hope button at the end. Not really expecting God to show up and show off in all of those areas of your life, even the ugliest parts of your life. We're his purchased possession. Let's fall in love again with what it means to be a peculiar people. Let's fall in love again with identity. You got to know this is who you are. And just like the Black Panther in the movie or Mr. Anderson and Neo, you know, in the Matrix, you know, how, how and where are you in a place where you need to stand on who you are? And, and the first thing that needs to change is not just, oh, what is there to do? What is there to do? The first thing is, who am I? Who am I? What I do does not define me. What he did for me is what defines me. He picked me. I'm his. So, Father, we just thank you today for ministering to us in this way. Uh, Lord, we just love you and we're rocked, Lord, that we're convicted and we're rocked. We're convicted that we are really handling your good news and abundant life with such a long-handled spoon. But Lord, we're so rocked that there's so much available. And Lord, we want to pray Paul's prayer right now. We want to ask Holy Spirit that you would give us more and more wisdom and revelation in who our daddy is. That we would know the hope of this calling. That we would come back to being a hopeful people. Meaning an expectant people. A people that expect you to show up when we call on you because you invented this economy of you being a good daddy. We ask that you would lead us, Holy Spirit, in just being rooted and grounded in his love. And that we would be ready to experience this love in a way that passes intellectually reading about it in a book. Lord, we're tired of reading another book on topics when there's an experience waiting for us because you're a living Lord. So Lord, have your way in our hearts. We repent of idols. We repent of excuse making. We repent of lukewarmly settling for so much less. And thank you that you come at the end of it all and say, there's one more thing I'm able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, we also pray that you would receive this morning's offering and that these tithes and offerings would be given as an act of worship to you. You love a cheerful giver and we worship you now in giving. Be glorified with every penny and may it be used for your kingdom work.
clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting those in the jails. And you said, whenever we've done to the least of these, we've done to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.